where Speaker Theresa Lahi is standing by for our standing every other Wednesday. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Rena, Chris, yes. Jason, and Guam. Good morning. Let's Good morning. Just, yeah. Happy yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to start with uh, the briefing because yesterday was the deadline for the legislature to file its brief and uh, the governor's request uh, to the Supreme Court to issue a declaratory judgment, um, I guess, her, on her organic act powers to quarantine individuals. Um, and also, um, I guess this also involves her, the emergency superpowers when a public health emergency is declared. So can you kind of go through um, the, the filing? Sure, be happy to. And thanks for the question, Sabrina. So yesterday was our deadline and our, our council filed a brief um, in response to the invitation from the Supreme Court to answer us to the question whether these two particular statutes contained in the health emergency law, whether they are inorganic or not. And so uh, we argued uh, the legislature argued that they are organic. They are consistent with the Organic Act that says, subject to the laws of Guam, the governor, um, you know, has powers of quarantine. But of course, so so we argued that these exercise of creating these laws that was done in legislatures past, um, it was actually sponsored by Eddie Cavill at the time, that the that exercise of uh, you know, uh, lawmaking authority by the legislature was absolutely valid. And in fact, uh, it was debated at the time. And um, they pointed out exactly what we are discussing today, that there are, you know, potentials for abuse of power. And so these were protections. These two statutes in particular give individuals access to the courts if they wanted to appeal their quarantine. And uh, so that these would be protections for those who were being quarantined and, and thought that uh, it should be reviewed by someone else. And um, so we stand firm that these are uh, within the powers of the legislature and as is the power to make laws regarding healthcare in general, healthcare, quarantine, and um, pretty much all topics on Guam, you know, the legislature has been authorized. To, to make laws on. Mm -hmm. So we believe that, that the laws and the governor's powers can act um, together and that they should act together and that one should not act without the other. Can we fast forward to the end? What does this mean in layman's terms if the governor wins or if you guys win? Well, I think um, it's important to me because I, I think, well, Technically, it's going to say whether these two statutes are organic or not, and whether a person in quarantine is going to have access to the courts to appeal that quarantine or not, right? That's one. But on a bit in the bigger picture, to me, this might uh, implicate the entire chapter that gives health emergency powers. Now, we gave the legislature gave these superpowers, and the governor is saying we've exceeded our authority in granting this type of power then really she she might be saying that she wants to act without any um, any rules, right? Or that she will create the rules. In fact, that is one of her arguments is that she will create the rules and that we should not have created any statutes, any type of parameters around her quarantine. And um, I just think, uh, I, I don't know, for me, that would be chaotic if we are going to rely on every different governor to create its own set of rules and um, not, not give these individuals any protections at all. And so that's really, I think the most important part is that these particular statutes are the ones that give individuals in quarantine the right to, to you know, go and tell somebody else. And in this right. case, it's the court. Right. And yeah, so that was the original reason why this uh, declaratory judgment was filed was because these individuals went to court mm -hmm. and um, the court was agreeing with them that public health had not, um, you know, either didn't have the correct reason to quarantine them or was not quarantining right. them according to the statute. And so now, you know, the governor's arguing, well, we shouldn't be bound by that statute anyways because the, the statute is inorganic. Right. And so, of course, we're arguing that no, quarantine 
you have the power to quarantine, you have the power to decide the public health authority, but your quarantine must fit within these parameters. And these are very general parameters, and they are the only parameters that give protections to the individuals. Right. And then what we're seeing now is the individuals have little to zero, but in most cases, no protection against quarantine. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of see the rhyme and the reason when you look at who's getting exempted from quarantine and more importantly, who's not. Um, right. And I, I feel like on any given day, like today, if someone was going into quarantine, they should have and be afforded the opportunity to go before the court. I mean, let's take fully vaccinated individuals right now. Like the CDC came out with this guidance, although they did defer to the states and the territories on the implementation of it. But I feel like if someone's coming to Guam and they're fully vaccinated and they have their negative test, they should be able to go before a judge and say, hey, the CDC says this. I shouldn't be have to held, uh, you know, go into this uh, government quarantine because I just feel like there probably hasn't been a single cabinet member who's had to sit through quarantine when coming back from travel. I would bet my paycheck that not a single cabinet member of this administration has had to sit in a quarantine hotel. Guaranteed. Um, but, you know... It, <laughs> I think they are that the laws are still in place despite this uh, request for an opinion by the Supreme Court. The laws remain in place. So I do believe that the public defender continues to represent people in quarantine who believe that they should be out for different reasons. Right. But I absolutely agree with you with the exemptions that I don't think the exemptions match our 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 risk or our health what we say on the other side, right? Yeah. That we're all at risk and this is what we're trying to protect from. I don't think they necessarily match each other. We're getting exemptions for people, yeah, because their work is important versus their lower risk or, you know, they won't spread it so much. They're completely different analysis. And um, I don't always necessarily agree either. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you know, what we're calling... Um, what, what do they say? Essential or more essential than others? Yeah, it's that's where we get it into the foggy areas, I think. Right. Um, like I've heard, um, you know, if you're accompanied by an essential or you are accompanying a, an essential person, you are also exempt. Right. right? Or, yeah. yeah things if you're like in the that, same household. Then, right. I'm, I just we just got the the brief that was filed, and I noticed a lot of reference to the section fourteen twenty one in the Organic Act, um, which you've kind of been talking about uh, regarding quarantine. But is there anywhere else in the Organic Act that that talks about, um, I guess, uh, the the governor's power to quarantine, or this is primarily it? That's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. that gives the governor power for health care and uh, hospitals and quarantine. But again, the very first line in that sentence is subject to the laws of Guam. Mm -hmm. So our argument is that that, of course, gives um, the legislature power to to create laws in these areas as well. And this was discussed in a prior case in, in Bergaglio versus Baldwin. It was also regarding the hospital. And in that case, the, um, the legislature had mandated that the hospital's board be appointed by different nonprofit groups or different groups that they would select, you know, a member to be on the board. And so it took away the power from the governor. But in this case, we take no power away from the governor. These laws have taken no power away from the governor. It's still the governor who is appointing the health, um, the public health, uh, you know, director, the mm. public health person in this whole pandemic. It's still the governor who is dictating through the guidelines, through public health, as to how these quarantines will really be uh, implemented, mm -hmm. right? And it's the governor's executive orders. We cite in our brief all the executive orders that the governor has has laid out, which which lay out, uh, in addition to the statute, additional processes for quarantine and who's exempt and who goes in and who doesn't. That mm -hmm. type of thing. It also just kind of seems like a, a whole separation of powers kind of thing because you know it just kind of when you read through it and you kind of like digest it it just seems like the governor is saying um legislature you guys can't tell me what to do uh, when it comes to quarantine uh, judicial branch uh, uh no step step back that's just kind of what it it seems when you you look at all of this is this kind of how you're viewing it as well 
No, you're you're absolutely right, Sabrina. You hit that right on that you know, right on the head. It's uh, that's exactly what it is. It, in fact, that's why we were invited because the Supreme Court recognized that it was a separation of powers question uh, directly affecting the legislature, and the question is exactly. Does the governor has this power have this power by herself, or you know, is this a power that the legislature is that is you know subject to laws of Guam created by the legislature? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't I I don't know if I finished my story about this. So this bill, the the laws that we're talking about were were made when Eddie Cabo, uh, he was a senator, he had sponsored these laws, and at the time they had a debate, and at the time. Senator, um, our governor was actually a senator at that time. Right. And so in the brief, you'll see that even the debate at that time was what we're talking about now, that we were worried, they were worried, and she was worried about um, individuals being quarantined, having no recourse, and that this was a protection for them, that this bill, you know, took care of these people. Oh, the irony. Balance. <laughs> and this bill was also back then it was signed by the former governor carl gutierrez right correct right now yes. soon we forget yep. <laughs> and i wanted uh, also just clarification in this emergency health powers act does it say that the governor um has all this power or does it say that the public health authority has the powers wow. um there are certain powers in that act given to the governor but almost all of the rest of them are given to the public health authority. And of course, ultimately the governor has the power to select the public health authority, right? right? So <laughs> that's her ultimate power, but, and to create the executive orders that waive laws, mm -hmm. right? So those two uh, clearly were given to the governor. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, in this situation, she appointed herself as the public health authority. Well, technically, in her one of her early on executive orders, it's, she appointed the, right. the director, which was Linda, Linda Denarcy at the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Linda that was interesting, Speaker, because as you may, uh, I'm, I know you know, Brie, it was like the governor was coming out and she was like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the boss, I'm the boss. And then there was some pivot where it was like all of a sudden she was like, oh, no, Linda Denarcy is the public health authority. Public health oversees it. But then what you ended up seeing was that the governor was just manhandling public health. You know what I mean? I, I don't even know if that's the right term to use. Well, Heavy yeah, hands. Yeah. The pit might have been because, yeah, we kept pointing out that the statute requires public health to be making these certain types right, of decisions, yeah. public health to be making this type of right. action. And, uh, you know. Right. And um, so, so that was uh, Linda DeNarcy was supposed to be in charge. But what they ended up doing was they were like digitally forging her signature to get her <laughs> approval on all kinds. Of, I mean, it's crazy, guys. Mm -hmm. So, Crazy. So was it an executive order uh, that moved, that allowed her to be the public health authority or that designated herself to be the public health authority? I, I, I don't recall that far back. No. You mean it allowed... Um, the, the governor to be the public no. health authority. No. No. She's arguing uh, Organic Act powers uh, uh, by that statute you pointed out. That mm -hmm. I mean, that Organic Act... Uh, provision that you pointed out that says uh yeah the okay. governor has power over hospitals health care mm -hmm. and quarantine but subject to the laws of the law uh, Madam Speaker, I wanted to uh, ask because I think Senator Duaneus had talked about uh in the states certain states where you have legislatures suing I want to say he said they were suing the governors over the um, federal monies and who has the authority, who has jurisdiction over these federal monies. Now that we're seeing this lawsuit, are we anticipating any type of legal action through the courts to maybe challenge uh, the governor's assertion that she's got the purse with the $600 million in it? Well, that's one option. I, I, am, I have not seen that on um, the table right now, but of course I am keeping close eye on all the other jurisdictions. I, I'm sure that our uh, Office of Finance and Budget Chair is doing the same. We are looking at uh, guidelines that are going to be coming out of the Treasury, and so we will we will take it from there. It's kind of, and of course, you know, I think um, it's incumbent on us as the legislature to be creative as well, right? I mean, if you can't directly dictate how the 661 million is going to be spent, you can definitely dictate how the rest of the budget of the government of Guam will be spent. And so you have to 
balance the two perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, and I know the chair, the finance chair keeps asking, uh, is this agency going to be getting any of the $661 million? Right. So, I, you know, I think everybody's trying to use uh, any method available to us to influence, yeah, how that will be spent. And at least to urge, you know, like, for example, the um, EITC, I know there is one bill to put it towards uh, different things, but that EITC money to me represents um, credit. It's tax credit it, it, for people. It's like a refund, right? It's money that they should get immediately when they file their taxes. And I would like to see that deposited immediately into the tax uh, trust account so that it pays it pays them right away, that there's no delay. Those are the people who need it the most, in fact, and so there should be no delay in paying them. And the other thing I'd like to see is that uh, I would like to see some assistance to these taxpayers who fit into that category so that we can avail of as much as possible, they can avail of that as much as possible as well, right? That they can get help in, um, doing their tax returns so that they, if they are eligible for EITC, that they are able to, right. to receive that. Speaker, what about in the, in the case of, uh, cause I know you're the tourism oversight, right? So, uh, the GVB president and permitting czar, uh, former governor, Carl Gutierrez, um, had come on this show and said, Oh, I'm going to ask uh, governor Lou for $20 million from the American rescue plan. Uh, then when the governor came on, we had asked her and she said, Oh yeah, he's getting 20 million. So in a case like that, do you then like minus 20 million from GVB's budget since they're getting this 20 mil from the American Rescue Plan? Because you see where it puts you guys in this interesting position where you've got the governor granting these millions and millions of dollars, which I don't even know how we police the spending of of that if it's outside of like the appropriation. Yeah, I, I expect all the agencies, the mayors, everyone to ask for, you know, part of the money and to, to prove why they need it. And I think, you know, we agree, GVB, they need some money. Their tourist attraction funds are, are are ridiculously low. So if they are going to market, they're going to need money. However, I was very surprised that the governor, you know, outright is already making commitments of this money without uh, giving us a plan. I think everybody wants to see a plan that looks comprehensive, that shows while you give GVB money, what happens to the rest, right? Yeah, who carries the burden? Who's left without yeah. anything? I, I really want to see that. And um, I think it's important. Um, but by the way, because I'm not the oversight chair of GVB anymore. Oh. It's uh, Senator Shelton is, yes. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, but, but, but I agree. It's, uh, we, that's exactly the type of question that we, we, need, we are trying to address, mm -hmm. I think, right now. By, yeah. by looking in advance at our FY22 budget that, you know, we're just a couple months away, maybe a month away from real deliberations on that. So I think all the ideas we're trying to, to mix up and, um, but that's one, it's like, if the governor is already making commitments yet, we are not going to see those, you know, that's the big question. When will we see what her plan is versus our plan? It should, in my, I, I keep arguing that we should have a combined plan. It yeah. should make sense to all of us. It make, should make sense. If it makes sense to us, it will make sense to the public. And we've all bought into that. And, and you know, that's I, that for me, the ideal way to, to do this budget. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do what we did last year. And we were, we were fighting over public health's budget last year. We were fighting over the hospital. We still have a budget request from the governor where the, the hospital receives no funds mm -hmm. and you know and so i i don't know it's uh i need to see does that mean that she's committed these federal funds to the hospital and you know, the hospital gets its own federal funds yeah. also but is it enough we don't know we, we shouldn't we shouldn't be i mean we shouldn't be sitting here trying to think out yeah. loud right where's this money going who's getting what i mean uh but we're, we've no, got I, we've got just a few minutes here speaker before we let's, why don't we take a break and then we'll bring her back on for the tv can we do that yeah we can um, can you hold through the break, uh, Madam Speaker? Of course, sure. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll be back with more of uh, Madam Speaker. I, and I really want to get you on this mm -hmm. uh, letter here that uh, was just penned a couple days ago to the chair of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, John uh, Rages. And this is uh, relative to um, that whole uh, 
I don't know if they're calling it, whatever they're calling it, but it's basically a land agent said, hey, Jack Attig did some stuff on my report and I was felt like I was coerced into making some type of applica- or line switch. or Anyway, so they had gone into executive session. We had had the chair on. It was just a massacre of a really uncomfortable interview. Um, and so now the speaker has uh, chimed in with his letter. So we'll, we're going to go into that uh, real quick. But uh, again, 757. Uh, on the Breeze radio side, we are KUAM FM in Hagatni, Guam. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be back with the KUAM TV portion of the link, which is brought to you by East West Rental Calvo Enterprises Carrier Jack in the Box IT and E. Good morning. It's the link. The world of t- KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. When we throw things away, where is away? What happens to our waste, and where does it go? As a community of small islands, the waste crisis is a large issue we want to bring into focus. Micronesia Climate Change Alliance presents From Our Nanas for Our Nennies, a video series about taking a holistic view of our present, finding wisdom from our past, and inspiring a better future. Airing every week during Earth Month, brought to you by Humanities Guahan and the National Endowment for the Humanities. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Get the job done the right way by getting the right stuff at East West Rental Center. With years of experience helping builders, we definitely got what you need. Call 646-1463 or visit us in Upper Tumon. Open Monday to Saturday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sundays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Only one company on Guam provides every solar energy solution under one roof. Micronesia Renewable Energy. You want solar only? They got that. You want solar with batteries? They got that too. You want outright purchase or lease purchase? It's up to you. Does your solar system need a tune-up? That's what they do. For solar energy solutions from A to Z, you can count on MRE. Give them a call at 632-2613 for a free consultation. MRE, providing real solar solutions built by real solar experts. Uno Go, delivering meals from your favorite restaurants and more, including delivering sodas and adult beverages from the Bottle Shack. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Also, follow them on Instagram and Facebook.
And welcome, KUAM TV Land. Good morning. My name is Chris. I'm Sabrina. And welcome to The Link at 8.05. The show is proudly brought to you by East West Rental, Cabo Enterprises, Carrier for my Aircon babies, IT&E, and Jack in the Box. All right, Jack in the Box fish sandwich and deluxe fish sandwich combo, panko crusted, wild caught Alaskan Pollock fish fillet. Grab one at your local Jack in the Box today. It's good stuff. Uh, let's get right back into it as uh, it's going to get pretty backed up here in a second. Uh, 8.05, we're going to continue our interview with the uh, speaker, Teresa Lahi of the Guam legislature, uh, who was penned a couple days ago a letter to, uh, and this wasn't the first, we're told, a letter to all of the commissioners with the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, and then another letter to the chairman, John Regis. I just wanted to read a little bit of this um, letter here to Chairman Regis and the commissioners. Uh, As you are all aware, in light of numerous allegations that have surfaced from our community and during public proceedings, I sent a letter on March 24th requesting the official findings regarding the concerns raised by a land agent at the trust who advised the commission that recommendations submitted under her name were altered by the director, Jack Hattig, and requesting a status on any actions the commission will take to address the concern. The commission classified this matter as a personnel issue and has denied disclosure of a report to the public based on this justification. However, I urge a reevaluation of this decision as the allegation of alteration raised by the land agent is essentially a matter of great public interest to beneficiaries as to how applications are processed. 
Um, and I guess we'll just first start. Uh, so, Speaker, obviously you don't think that this whole issue was a personnel issue? They may have personnel issues, and I don't know what they discussed, but the, the issue that was brought up in the meeting that we are talking about, and I think you're talking about, is is how the application or whatever the request was by the beneficiary was being processed, whether the recommendations by the land agent were being altered or not. That is absolutely not a, um, it might have personal implications, but the public and the beneficiaries especially need to know how those cases are being handled. We need to know first and foremost, were there other cases like that where the land agent's recommendations were altered? That's simple. They should have that answer now. And uh, I want to know, were there other ones? Were there other ones at the uh, cases that the commission made a decision based on an altered recommendation, right? That's very important. And if I'm a commissioner, I would want to know, you know, I'm, I'm relying on these agents and we trusting, we're trusting that, you know, they're experienced, they know what they're doing. Anyways, that there's no, no you know, other interests involved, just straight up, uh, you know, the facts, hopefully. We tried to ask the, the chairman. That's, that's, that's the one thing, yeah. I think that they they need to answer those questions. And and so when I first found out that they went into executive session, yeah, I, I couldn't fathom uh, how that was going to answer these types of questions for the beneficiaries, right? Hmm. Now, if they have personnel issues, that's a separate matter. And uh, I don't know what those are because they haven't stated. So I've also asked them to tell me what the issues are that they are going into executive session. I've also asked two weeks ago for them to, to give me a copy of that report that they made regarding the, you know, their interview of the agents. Because, I, because of that, I want to know, is this a a problem that is like pervasive it you know has it been going on for years or is it just one you know incident and uh i think if we could find out that it was one incident you know we could we could shut this and be done with it and uh then the commission can deal with uh, their director as they you know feel is appropriate and i also in my letter reminded the commission that it's totally within their authority uh, the hiring of the director of the trust, and it's their responsibility to ensure that this director right. is evaluated. It's supposed to be evaluated annually to make sure that they are, you know, doing what they're supposed to do. And I know that uh, back in 2019, they had, when I think when they brought him on, had given him a list of things that they wanted him to accomplish. And so I'm, I am expecting that they, if they have a personal matter, I hope it's that, that they are you know, checking whether, what is the progress of, uh, you know, our accomplishments yeah. with, with this director? Well, just having followed the, the land trust, I know that um, there had been an effort to remove Mr. Hattig as the uh, administrator of the land trust. But however, I mean, obviously the governor is uh, backing him um, through this. And she had said her quote was that she didn't think that he meant to do anything against the rules and regs, which to me sounds like there was a breach of those rules and regs. However, the governor believes it's not intentional. But, Speaker, what's the remedy? Because what we have here, it appears that they abuse the executive session to discuss matters that should have been discussed openly and publicly. However, they weren't, and they were able to discuss whatever, who knows, behind closed doors in executive session. And now we can't get the report. There's no way of knowing what was discussed. So what is the remedy for the people of Guam? Well, we've seen it in other cases. For example, the GWA and GPA pay raises when that was done in executive session should not have been. There are things that you cannot discuss in executive sessions or cannot make decisions on back there. And uh, the attorney general was very um, active to you know, come out and condemn them and tell them they have to reverse those actions or those actions were null and void. And I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen here. It's it's kind of awkward because it's the, uh, the attorney general has a representative that is advising the trust. And I know that the commission, the, the chair, and I, you know, I feel for these chairmen of not just this commission, but all their boards, they're very reliant on counsel and, uh, and, you know, we want to, trust that these councils are giving them some good advice as to when they are in executive session that it's appropriate. But um, just because we've seen it before, you know, it's not always the case. So I would like for the attorney general to take a look at this as he has 
you know, the other executive session cases and, and make his own determination as to whether this is appropriate advice his councils as to, you know, what the board should be doing going forward. And that uh, I've also, I also wrote him a letter a couple of weeks ago asking, or maybe a week ago, asking that he provide again uh, training for all boards and all directors on open government law and FOIA. Those two laws, I think, are so very important that if these commissioners and these board uh, directors can do not understand those, like, you know, up and down, we run into all kinds of problems. And so um, I've confirmed, we have, you know, gone through the process, confirmation hearings for so many people this term. And I mean, last term, this term, they're, they're relatively new. And a lot of these people are coming in without any government experience at all. I don't think they're used to these uh, open government laws. And so I think, and the attorney general gave an excellent presentation uh, in 2019 uh, at my request to senators. And so I'm asking him to do that again for the boards, the commissioners, and uh, that they they get all, you know, get up to speed on, on um, open government and FOIA in particular. Right. Yeah. Other laws, I think I listed there, but those are the most important ones that uh, this is where we're going to have lots of issues. Right. And I mean, uh, this commission, as you know, is a, we've got pretty much all three members on the commission that are active right now are all new. The only experienced commissioner is on, uh, I think he's on active duty, so he's not available. Yeah. So, you know. It's this turnover also of, you know, uh, chairpersons of the commissions and the commissioners. It, they have to continue to be, you know, um, yeah, to improve the process. To We're going to have to educate them in, in these laws. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you could kind of see like, and, and I don't know if that's a reflection of the commissioner's private sector experience, but in the private sector, when an allegation like this would come up, like, let's say I, you know, forged. Sabrina's time card or whatever. What would traditionally happen in a private sector environment is it would not be a public open discussion. It would be you get called into the boss's office, they shut the door and you know, no one else in the company would know what happens. But this is not the private sector, right? But speaker, I just no, wanted this, to And this is not a timesheet, you know. Yeah. This is yeah. an application for for land and it's their sole duty is to process these things correctly and that's how we got into the Barragata Heights mess, Chris, that you always <laughs> like to point out. And that that is how we're going to stay out of that kind of mess, is by keeping what's supposed to be public, public, keeping the decisions in front of the board. It's why I objected to, you know, a couple months ago, there was a resolution to delegate, again, authority back from the board, the commission, to the director. And I very much objected to that, saying that's how we got here in the first place. We're not going backwards, I hope. We're going to move forward with checks and balances. Whatever the director does can be reviewed by a board. What what the agents recommend also can be reviewed by a board. And, and the board, you know, you're going to have to really uh, be very diligent and do their own research if they have to, mm. you know, on... We had we had Senator John Brown on yesterday, and this is my last question on this. We asked her point blank, should there be an oversight hearing on this issue? She said yes. Your your thoughts, Madam Speaker? I've, I've actually told uh, the, the chairperson in my letter that uh, first my, my first letter, I didn't get a um, an official response. I didn't get a I didn't get the records I was asking for the report. I didn't get the topic of the executive session. And I'm not satisfied whether the issue that was brought up uh, was a pervasive one or it's a single time, you know, uh, failure or, or mistake, right? And so those three things I'm not satisfied with. So that's why I wrote the second letter and I, I asked again, and then I, I said more about um, their authority to, to you know, um, it's their authority to deal with their chairperson. However, these beneficiaries need this information and I want this information. And if, you know, we don't get it, we are going to set up an oversight hearing. I just think it's so much faster to get this information. Why wait for an oversight hearing? They should just produce this information right away. Mm -hmm. And we can have an oversight hearing, but like I said, I think uh, if we're talking about things that are going on, you know, government law, the AG should get involved. And if we're talking about things where somebody's 
um, forging somebody's name, the AG should get involved, right? I mean, that should be determined. And uh, and if it's not happening, then they should say that straight up, you know? And uh, let's move on because this trust has a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. Yep. It just seems unconscionable that uh, you haven't received a response. We're going on a month since they went into executive session, um, and they discussed it's the a, findings of this um, investigation. Yeah, but you even, uh, haven't even gotten a is, phone call or anything. No, I, yes, I've talked to the chair, mm-hmm. and 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 but yeah, you know what? What I'm saying is, they're saying they're relying on their counsel that they're doing this under counsel's advice. And so that's why I think, you know, the attorney general needs to take a look at this because I, I'm not, I don't is, know. I'm is not there counsel a, a private yeah. attorney yeah. or is yeah. it a assistant AG? It's Toft, right? Is it Toft? Yeah. Nicholas Toft of the AG's office. He's like an assistant mm-hmm. AG. Um, Madam Speaker. Well, if it's an assistant AG that's representing the CLTC and we're going to ask the AG. Yeah, I mean... That's the way it is, Sabrina. Unfortunately, all of the agencies are represented by uh, assistant AG, but, um, well, GWA wasn't when the attorney general got involved. You're correct. But still, the attorney general, they they, they are absolutely able to give some another set of eyes on this and make sure that you know, it's proper. What about the employees, uh, Madam Speaker? So you have here a classified land agent supposed to be protected by the merit system, has no other option but to testify before a board in a public setting, uh, you know, raising these allegations about a director. The whole matter promptly gets swept under the executive session carpet. How do we guarantee our hardworking classified employees that their uh, elected leaders and the people that are put in positions of power over them are going to be held accountable that their the leaders are going to defend um, these employees when instances like this come up well in you know I actually want to commend the chairperson because when he heard that from the employee he stopped the meeting immediately or he stopped action on this and said he was going to investigate so what I'm saying is let's just hear the results of your investigation or or you know, put it on the record what's going on with this type of action. And I, I, like I did before, I want to commend this employee. I do believe employees, despite merit protection, are very fearful of reprimand or uh, retribution. That they they remain very fearful of that. I acknowledge that, and um, you know, uh, I don't I don't want to call them out either. I don't want to call them to a public hearing where they have to say this in front of everyone. You know, they just want to do their jobs, and so I'm really trying to put the pressure on the entire commission to do their jobs as well, to make sure that uh, if this type of behavior is pervasive, that it, that it get addressed immediately. Okay. Well, from one land agency to uh, another, the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission, you are calling uh, and holding an oversight hearing uh, tomorrow. Is that correct? And, and can you go into the background on what prompted this oversight hearing? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you asked about this. This is uh, really top of my mind today. It is, um, so the ancestral lands, you know, they too, uh, this is another one of these agencies, they've been underfunded for years. So they, you know, it's really hard to get their mission accomplished. I think uh, we, we, anyway, and there there are other issues that are, are you know, plaguing this ish, this commission, however, one of them should not be their list of uh, ancestral land owners and the list of properties, right? Now this they excel in. They are excellent at determining, you know, well, making their list of properties and finding the heirs. In fact, we've got lists of properties that are ready to be returned to heirs that they cannot locate. And so I I'm, I'm want to help them with that. But more importantly, I want to help them that we have since 2011, the, the military has promised as part of this uh, whole build up box to end up on Guam with a net negative uh, land, you know, that they would end up with less land than they started with in 2011 after the build up. So they're, you know, they're increasing in some parts and they're trying to decrease in others. So, but, but what I found in researching this is that since, um, 2011, between 2011 and 2017, when the first report was mandated by Congress. So so in 2017, they came out with a report that showed 
they planned to return 126 acres more, mm -hmm. right? That they had returned 600 acres and were planning to return 126 more acres. But since that report in 2017, we are seeing the same lists of land, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Some of those, I think a couple parcels on that list of 126 acres actually were removed because the military is saying now that they need them. And in response to the governor's request, they've added a couple parcels, including Eagles Field. Well, yeah. 50 acres of Eagles Field. And the governor had requested uh, hundreds of acres. I can't even remember how big that, that is. It, it's much, much larger. 50 acres is a, a very tiny portion of it. So they've also agreed to return um, nine, more, nine more parcels. So what I want to make sure with this hearing is that the Ancestral Lands Commission gets all the help that it can get in making sure that these landowners whose property are on these lists of land to be returned since ever since, right? Since 2017 at the very least, that they are aware of it and that they can be vocal, that they can be told you're on this list. And now I want them to be told that the military took you off the list, by the way, or I want them to be told, oh, there's another twist, right? Now the government of Guam is saying they're going to keep some of these parcels of land instead of going through the Ancestral Lands Commission. And I want to know what is the Ancestral Lands Commission position on that? I think it's very important to know whether the Ancestral Lands Commission is going to fight for these ancestral landowners, you know, for to, to ensure that the law that we pass is going to be honored or not. Because if not, these ancestral landowners may be added to this long list of landowners whose property will never be returned because it's being kept by the government of Guam or kept by the military. And these landowners, according to a commitment that the government of Guam made, not, not the federal government, but the government of Guam made a commitment to these landowners that we would compensate you if we could not give you back the land. And we have not made, the government of Guam has not made good on that promise or that commitment yet. And um, if we are going to get there, the landowners need to know who they are. They need to know that that is the decision by the government of Guam. They should have an input as to that decision in, by the government of Guam. I think that's very important as well, that, you know, that they know at, uh, as early as possible so that they can also have an input as to whether their lands will be returned and whether they're going to be going to be added to the list of uh, people who need to be compensated. Now, the compensation is a whole other <laughs> issue. We could spend three days on that alone, Sabrina, but in a nutshell, it is, um, they're supposed to be using um, crown lands or lands that, uh, according to the records, you know, it's not really true, but according to the records, have no ancestral landowners. They're supposed to be using those lands to develop and to bring an income to the trust. And that income, that cash, they are supposed to use to compensate those landowners who will never get their properties back that the government of Guam has decided to keep. For example, the airport properties, right? right? So um, that's the issue is now, you know, the trust, it, it, all kinds of twists here. You know, even now the trust tells us uh, we need to use some of that money for our operations because we got kicked out of the land management uh, you know, area. We need to get our own lease now. We need to pay for our own director now. And uh, the costs continue to increase. They want agents. I want them to have some agents, but um, you know, I do not want the beneficiary's money to be spent on operations. So that's kind of where things lie right now. It's like, you know, we're, we're debating, are we gonna, um, pay these people, they have rules which are proposing to pay, to pay a different class of people than what is said in the law. That's another issue that's going to be brought up at the hearing. I want them to explain why they, they want a change in the law to, to change who would be the beneficiaries of, of the monetary compensation. Wow. And then of course, you know, we need to make sure that the investments of this trust are really uh, getting the most value that it can and and so yeah. that we can get something to these uh beneficiaries yeah it's really a justice issue right so this is a whole 
for years. It's a, I'm part, I'm a small part of a years, decades, <laughs> decades long fight to get these ancestral right. lands yeah. uh, to the owners. And, um, and I think that's the number one priority. Second is if they can't get it back to give them compensation, but I think everybody wants their land. That was, you know, what was said for decades. So yeah, we're, just, we're I, talking I, the other day about like the lack of a, I just remember back in the heyday, you had Patty Garrido, you had, of course, Ed Beneventi, Nashon Chamorro. A lot of them were just like really hard on the land return and the excess land. So uh, we wanted to follow up on the, um, just real quick before we let you go, the investigation that was supposed to be conducted by public health. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, yeah. I actually had two more things. Yeah, oh, the yeah there, can I just yeah, add one thing? Yeah. The, for example, the Eagles Field, right, that uh, the, the military says they will return 50 acres of Eagles Field. And so I've asked the Ancestral Land Commission to tell me who are the owners of the Eagles Field. And yeah. so they have. And so I've given that list to you. And I am hoping that you can let these landowners know that they are on that list. You know what I mean? That's part of it. So even just the landowners in Eagles Field, the, the list is very long. And um, I just want everybody to know at, uh, as things change, what the status of their property is. I still have people coming to my office asking me, isn't my land going to be returned? And their land is where the Salvation Army is. And their land is where these Oasis new center is going to be built. And I said, you know, they, they believe they were promised years ago that that land would be returned. And so I'm looking through the documents. I, I don't see the promise. Uh, I see a deed to, you know, um, Salvish, I mean, to the Gura, actually. So it's Gura who's subleasing it to, or, you know, yeah. letting uh, these other people use it, which, is, you know, the programs are great, but but we haven't resolved that other issue over there. And so these these landowners, they look at this, they look at it. And they're very, you know, very quiet. And um, that's why I want to speak for them at this today. You know, I want to speak for them tomorrow at our hearing. I want I want the Ancestral Lands Commission to decide whether they are going to speak for these people as well and make sure that, uh, you know, they're not forgotten, that our commitment to them is not forgotten. Right. So sorry. I know. So now you wanted to talk about public health. Yeah. Um, uh, the nurses yes. and the, that investigation. Yeah. Okay. I think... Um, uh, I, I went back to the director again, and I think, so what the final, well, I can't ever say final, you know, with this, <laughs> so that to them right. to tell you when it's final. But right now, what I think has happened is that the, I think, um, as I told you before, they switched the management of the facilities. They changed the nurses in charge. They've taken those people that were complained about, and they've actually moved them out. At first, they just moved them, and we, no one was satisfied with that, not me, not the nurses who complained. And so, but now we found out that the directors actually let those people go, and um, they were temporary to begin with, so they're, they've been let go. This is, um, uh, uh, well, action was taken. And, and the other issue was, you know, whether they had... Um, Made fraudulent accounting of their time. The director told me, I asked him why, why did Byrne go on the radio and say he doesn't know anything about it? Um, he said, well, he, the director of public health clarified for me that he was working with one of the DOA agents uh, in that regard or uh, employees and that, uh, um, I don't know. That's the arrangement they have. Now, mm -hmm. that part I'm not going to vouch for as to status because it just seems to be taking forever and ever, and uh, I don't know. But anyways, I what I what I do know is that the the managers that public health put into these quarantine facilities are some of the um, very long-standing supervisors at public health, and they're excellent. So I don't expect any kind of reports like that. And I think the morale of those who are working there has improved because of those changes. So that's very important to me. So I'm, I'm very glad for that. I, I also just wanted to follow up since we're talking about quarantine is the quarantine and the isolation facilities and the money that we are just, you know, making it rain and paying out. Um, and, you know, we're there's hardly anybody over at the isolation facility 
the quarantine facility, we're looking at, you know, if we achieve this path to half, um, 50 percent um, uh, fully vac full vaccinations, that people wouldn't have to quarantine anymore. Have you heard anything? What are we going to do about the the quarantine facility in Tumon and the isolation facility? Because last, you know, we heard it was $20 million, but that was just from October to, I believe, January. It's now April. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, the, cost, the costs are very high. But um, all I know, Sabrina, is that in May, when we go into, you know, uh, opening up or, or no quarantine for those who have uh, negative tests, right, then... Um, we should have a smaller need for quarantine. We, of course, have a very uh, small need right now for isolation. And uh, but I, there may still need to be some quarantine available. I'm guessing here, of course, yeah. I'm speculating because it's not clear. But I'm speculating that there will need to be some quarantine available if we are going to quarantine those who do not test negative or who tested positive, right? And so, but but of course, the numbers should be so low. They should be so few. It should, right. um, and last I checked, all that quarantine facility was being um, reimbursed by FEMA. So it wasn't coming out of the CARES Act money last I checked. But of course, in the beginning, it was all coming out of the CARES money. In fact, that's why they were saying they could bypass all the procurement laws yeah. was because it's CARES money, it's federal money, we don't need to follow. And I'm, I'm just glad that they're trying to follow procurement laws now. And so... You know, I, it was months ago when they told us they were changing the facilities. They were, you know, in the middle of, um, um, you know, the procurement process to change those facilities. But now, now that things are changing so fast, and we might be in PCOR four, you know, in soon, or maybe when that travel, you know, is opened, they might go inside. So that's uh, that just changes everything, right? But I still think when people are positive, we should as a government, provide a place for them to isolate. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't need to be an entire hotel yeah. at all, but you know, we need an isolation place. So I think we still need to have that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thanks, Speaker. Thank you. Take care. Okay, appreciate it. There you go. That's our standing every other Wednesday with uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi. A lot of stuff on her plate, uh, you know, relative to her oversight. Let's